on uh, Gideon's legacy. We'll all leave some kind of a legacy in this world. And so we're going to read then, uh, starting at verse 22 of chapter 8, and we'll read about Gideon's legacy. Hear then the word of God. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon. And his family. Thus, Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abias rites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bareth as their god and did not remember the Lord their god who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. And so far, the reading of God's Word. Dear people of God, I'm sure many of you we're well aware of the provincial election that was held five weeks ago with Daniel Smith and our United Conservative Party being elected to form the government once again. And if you follow the news at all, you would know that it was a very divisive campaign, not just for the politicians, but also within the media itself. I found it really interesting how those who favored the UCP had no use for Rachel Notley and, her, and the NDP based on their previous term in government. And meanwhile, those who favored the NDP had huge mistrust issues with Daniel Smith due to some of her past controversial statements and political positions. Well, we'll see how her government performs over the next four years. And I suspect that, with, like with all politicians, the history books will portray her with a mixture of good and bad. And that shouldn't surprise us, because there's no such thing as a perfect leader. Now, it was no different for Gideon in the days of the Bible. Judges 7 shows Gideon being used by God in a powerful way to, to work out God's purposes for his people Israel. And you know, that has earned Gideon a place in the hall of fame of faith in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Gideon is, 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 is listed there along with all the other heroes of faith of the nation of Israel. But as we look to chapter 8 in Gideon, 
It shows that Gideon was far less than a perfect leader. This passage, like the book of Judges as a whole, focuses on a crisis of leadership within Israel. The, the Israelites say to Gideon in verse 22, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. We heard about that last Sunday. And, and that's happened on, on, on numerous occasions throughout the history, say, for example, of the, of the United States. A victorious army general will be, will be pressured by the people. Why don't you come and, and be our president? And that's happened a number of times throughout the U.S. history. Now, Judges 8, verse 23 shows Gideon promptly and emphatically declare, declining this invitation to be king. Because Gideon knew that it was God himself who had chosen him as leader in Israel in this time when there was no king in Israel. A time, as Judges 17, verse 6 says, everyone did as they saw fit. Now, in this time of basking in Gideon's great victory over the Midianites in chapter 7, the people wanted to reward Gideon. They wanted to reward him for his courageous leadership. And the, king, and the people also wanted a king. A king to lead them just like all the surrounding nations. Thinking that this would guarantee them a greater sense of peace and security from their enemies. And interestingly, this foreshadows a similar request Sometime later in 1 Samuel 8, when the Israelites requested a king from the prophet Samuel, there too they wanted a king like the other nations around them. Which begs the question, why did Gideon refuse this request to become their king? I mean, no doubt that would have been a, been a tempting prop, proposition for, for Gideon. I mean, who wouldn't want the power? Who wouldn't want the influence and, and the material riches that would come with being king over Israel? How easy it would have been for Gideon to rationalize this in his own mind. Just think. He would be the first in a long line of kings in the nation of Israel. And what a wonderful legacy that would be for him and for his family. But Gideon didn't allow that temptation to get the better of him. He promptly reminds them of Israel's uniqueness among their heathen nations. Gideon knows he has no right to be king over Israel. They already had a king, a heavenly king. God himself. It was God himself who deserved all the credit for the great victory over the Midians, Midianites that we, we talked about last Sunday. And as the king of all kings, God is more powerful than any other earthly ruler. And Gideon knew it. And he wanted the people to know it too. And as much as we need to applaud Gideon for avoiding this temptation for personal advancement and achievement, we see how it opens up another whole new can of worms for Gideon in his next breath. While acknowledging God's divine rule over Israel, Gideon introduces a compromise of obedience on another level. And the author of Judges thereby points out Gideon's failure as judge over Israel. We see the nature of, of Gideon's sin in verse 24, where Gideon says, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from the share of the plunder. Now, that, that, that seems like a very innocent request. It didn't seem like a whole lot. Just give me an earring. That's not all that much. Just, just a small token of appreciation from each of you. A small share of the plunder from the defeated enemy. It seemed like just a drop in the bucket compared to what any other king would have expected from the people to celebrate the victory. 
And when all the gold gets collected, it totals some 43 pounds of gold. That's right, 43 pounds of gold. Imagine what that would cost today. A few ounces of gold costs a fortune, but 43 pounds, wow. Now, we, we, the Bible doesn't, doesn't judge Gideon for, for, for being greedy here. It indicts him for the way he uses this gold. From these spoils of gold, uh, uh, from these spoils of war, Gideon constructs an ephod, a kind of golden image. A and he set that up in his hometown. And notice the condemning commentary of that in verse 27, where it says, All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare for Gideon and his family. Now, this story reminds us of a similar kind of situation in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 32. Those of you who know the Bible know that there's a story there about Aaron. How Aaron fabricated a golden calf. And in both of these cases, a golden image constructed from earrings became a form of idol worship. And in both cases, the Bible judges this as a case of spiritual prostitution. A blatant unfaithfulness to God, like that of a husband or wife being unfaithful to, a, to their spouse. Gideon might not have intended for this to happen. He, he, he didn't intend this to be some form of idolatry. But our text portrays it as a tragic failure in Gideon's leadership over Israel. Gideon avoids the temptation of taking on the role of king in Israel. And now with this golden ephod, he takes on a role as a religious leader in Israel, something that he had no business doing. Gideon, the humble man of God, who was used to tear down an altar to Baal in chapter 6, now leads these same people back into idol worship. The leadership crisis in Israel is really much greater than what meets the eye. The question could be asked, was there no godly priest in Israel to stand up to this compromise against God's second commandment to not worship any other gods? Let alone to sharpen the conscience of God's people. Where was the religious leadership within Israel at that time? Now, falling into this subtle kind of temptation happens much easier than we think. Temptation is, is something like a trap door. One careless step, one misplaced foot, one click on the internet, and before we know it, we're plunging down the slippery slope into new kinds of temptation in our lives. You see, this story portrays Gideon standing between two of, uh, uh, of such trapdoors. And the trapdoor lying before him has its fullest attention. And he eyes it with great caution. The temptation expressed in the words of the people, Be our king! And that was a very real temptation for Gideon. And besides the obvious attractions of power and prosperity coming with, their, with this position, there's the temptation of, of maximizing his, his lifelong influence within Israel. And in light of what's already been done to set Israel free from the Midianites, and what he's already done to stretch Israel's faith, in their God of the impossible, just think how much good he could continue to do as their king. It took a lot of uh, discipline for Gideon not to succumb to this temptation. Many others would have, would have jumped at the opportunity for such self-advancement. 
It's not easy to maintain pure motives as a leader over God's people. Even for pastors or leaders within the church today. It's not easy for elders and deacons as we focus on Installation Sunday here today. It's not easy being being a leader with integrity within the church today. While Gideon cautiously backs away from this trapdoor, he unwittingly steps into another trapdoor that gives way beneath him, plunging him into another scenario of sin-riddled grief. And that's how it often goes with temptation in our lives. We avoid one pitfall, and before we know it, we plunge into the next. And the result of this action, which now severely counters his earlier commitment to God as the king of his life, means that, is, that, means that Gideon's influence is now kept to his own lifetime. It's even questionable how much he actually affected the spiritual commitment of the people of Israel. Now, he, he, he did start a, a reform movement in the, people, uh, in the nation of Israel. He, he did bring about a measure of peace for, in the land for 40 years. But Gideon was unable to bring any lasting kind of peace to the nation of Israel. It was especially in this area of worship that Gideon ultimately fails as leader over God's people. The construction of this, of this golden ephod neutralized the earlier reforms in Israel. His witness and, and his leadership were severely compromised. And the legacy he leaves for his family and the nation has no lasting effect. The religious reform movement that began with such promise in chapter 6 hits rock bottom with his son Abimelech, who we can read about in the next chapter, in chapter 9. The leadership crisis during the period of the judges remains unresolved within Israel. In other words, it was only by God's grace that Gideon is even included among the faithful of the Hall of Fame chapter in in Hebrews chapter 11. The weakness and the failures of Gideon quickly counterbalance his strengths that we read about in the, early, in, the, in the chapter earlier, in chapter 7. And Gideon's story vividly shows how God in his wisdom continues to work through imperfect people. Imperfect people like Gideon. Imperfect people like, like other Bible characters like Moses and David the Apostle Peter, and the Apostle Paul. Imperfect people like you and me. But this story also urges us to be faithful in our commitment to provide godly leadership within our families as parents or grandparents. That We look to provide godly leadership within, within our workplaces or our farms. We look to provide godly leadership within our church and our community as a whole. See, in various ways, Gideon represents Israel as a whole. His wonderful confession of faith and trust in God is is compromised by his sinful indiscretion. His verbal professions of faith and trust are gone, loses its impact by his selfish actions. And how often don't we, as parents, as leaders within the church, mirror the strengths and the weaknesses of Gideon. We too can make our our, our powerful professions of faith and our trust in God, and we do that personally, and we can do that collectively as a church. And yet the applications of such professions sometimes can remain so inconsistent in our daily living. And the lasting effect of our diligent ministry and service within the church or community can sometimes be compromised by our personal inconsistencies. The word Christian can be tarnished when we neglect the implications of our half-hearted devotion and obedience to Jesus. Jesus. 
and the weakness of our inconsistent leadership as parents and leaders within the church, when we withstand one temptation only to fall into the trap door of another, often negates our usefulness and witness for God in this world. Really, it's only by God's grace that Christ's church still exists with such inconsistent leadership throughout the centuries, isn't it? And many people refuse to darken the door of a church today because they point to the failures of the church, the failures of leadership within the church. And recognizing the shortcomings of such leaders as Gideon and acknowledging our own frequent faults and weaknesses, that profoundly enhances our appreciation for the life and the work of Jesus who God sent into this world as the perfect judge, as the perfect Savior that each one of us needs. Jesus, who God sent into this world, never compromised His loyalty to His Heavenly Father for any kind of personal gain in this world. Jesus' allegiance to God as the true King in Israel was never distorted by sin. Jesus' legacy wasn't restricted to one generation like that of Gideon. Jesus has left an eternal legacy as our perfect Savior and our righteous judge. And we have every reason to thank Him and praise Him for that. We owe Him our very lives because without Jesus, we would have no hope for any kind of spiritual inheritance in this life or for the life to come. Which begs the question, what kind of legacy do you hope to leave behind in this world? What kind of legacy will you leave for your children or grandchildren? And when your life comes to an end someday, which will happen for each one of us, what will they remember you for? What kind of legacy will you leave for the people in your neighborhood or your workplace? Will it be the legacy of a life that's fully committed to serving God and His kingdom purposes? Or will it be a legacy that's more focused on the self-centered thinking and the practices of this world? I remember a few years ago how Billy Graham gave what was called his final sermon on his 95th birthday. It was just a short message and then a prayer urging people to come, come to, to faith in Jesus. But what a wonderful legacy this man Billy Graham has left for the cause of Christ in this world. A legacy that's well respected by both Christians and non-Christians throughout this whole world. A legacy that's, that's seasoned by a continual focus on God's love and God's grace to him and to Jesus as Savior of his life. How he continually pointed people to Jesus and how people needed Jesus in their lives. And may it be that the wonder of God's grace in Jesus inspires us in our faithful service and witness for him in our world. As the Apostle Paul says in Acts 20, verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if, I may, if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And that was the legacy of the Apostle Paul. And my hope and my prayer for each one of us is that God will likewise stir our hearts by His Holy Spirit to build a legacy within our families, to build a legacy within this church and this community 
that inspires others to seek God's way of truth and salvation in Jesus that we have now embraced as His imperfect followers of this, in this, within this world. You see, ultimately, the most important legacy for us will be when we stand before Jesus someday and He says to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into my happiness, says Jesus. May that be the legacy for each of our lives here. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we know that you want us to live our lives here on, earth, here on this earth as fully devoted followers of Jesus in every aspect of our lives. And like Gideon, we don't always do that so well. One moment we live out our commitment to you in a bold and courageous way, and then the next moment we find ourselves falling into some kind of trapdoor of sin. We need your forgiveness. We need your, your grace, your love for us, Lord Jesus. We need you to re renew us and to empower us by your Holy Spirit to live the kind of life that will impact the lives of our children and our grandchildren, that will impact the lives of our fellow church members, that will impact the lives of our neighbors and fellow workers for your kingdom purposes. Lord God, we pray that you will guide us as a church to focus first and foremost on building a Christ-centered legacy of pointing people to Jesus in our lives. And may it be, Lord, that this is the kind of church that attracts people to Jesus because of the way that we live our lives as followers who are committed fully to you. And so we pray that in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.